Hello, H Civil War subscribers, and welcome to another episode of the Civil War Era and Digital Humanities. My name is Chase McCarter, PhD student in history at the University of New Mexico and resource editor for H Civil War. In this episode, I spoke with Dr. Gregory Downs about his project, Mapping Occupation, which he created with Dr. Scott Nesbitt from the University of Georgia. Dr. Downs is a professor of history at the University of California, Davis, who specializes in the political and cultural history of the United States during the 19th and 20th century, with particular focus on the transformative impact of the Civil War, the end of slavery, and the role of military force in establishing new meanings of freedom. Dr. Downs is also the author of three books, with his most recent publication entitled The Second American Revolution, The Civil War Era Struggle Over Cuba, and The Rebirth of the American Republic, published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2019. Dr. Downs' digital project, Mapping Occupation, reorients understandings of the reconstruction that followed Confederate surrender by presenting new views of Southern political space. It argues that U.S. power in the Reconstruction South existed where the government could enforce its laws through the army. Moreover, it visualizes the more limited areas from which black Southerners could reach soldiers, highlighting the unequal geography of the army and the civilians who used it to assert their rights. I hope you enjoy our conversation. All righty, uh, Dr. Downs, thank you so much for uh, joining me today to talk to uh, Ace of War about your uh, digital project, Mapping Occupation. Thanks so much for having me, Chase. I'm delighted to be here. All right. Um, so I was wondering if we could start off uh, by talking a little bit about your background in digital humanities. Um, I'm always interested in how people get involved, you know, whether, you know, uh, people have been doing this for a long time, et cetera. Yeah, so you asked about my background in digital humanities and uh, the first answer I would give is minimal. Um, so I approach this, you know, there are people who approach it with a deep, uh, level of uh, um, technical expertise or a deep, uh, you know, level of engagement with digital humanities and we are kind of looking for historical projects that will work for it. And then there's other people who could have come with historical projects where they start to realize that the digital tools are really necessary um, to access the kinds of not just answers, but even questions that they would like to ask. Uh, so the people for whom, you know, the digital is the, the first part of the experience and the people who blunder toward it. And I'm in the latter category. I was working on a project on uh, the role of the military in the U.S. South during occupation. I had started with a presumption that what I was going to be studying um, was about the cultural and political context for the lack of occupation. And I was interested in some of the work being done on other occupations, much of it inspired by U.S. experience in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, that really looked at the difficulties uh, within democracy of sustaining uh, support for the expense, the human cost, um, and uh, the other costs of, uh, of occupations, uh, you know, of occupations, and of what that could tell us about the limits of Reconstruction. So I began with the sense that this might give us a window to open up some other questions about governance and the limits of reconstruction. Um, so what I thought I would do is I would just, uh, you know, kind of open up a book, find out where the military was all the time, uh, use that as a baseline, you know, and then look to interpret that through ongoing cultural and political debates and policy debates in the army and Congress uh, elsewhere. Um, and instead, I found that a lot of the data that people used to make generalizations about the occupation um, was very partial and didn't reveal at all what they thought it would. Essentially, the Secretary of War would give a statement of where military units were as he prepared his annual report. Um, and occasionally in that, there would be references to individual places uh, where the military had been. Um, but this uh, frozen in time moment actually didn't capture a great deal, in part because so much of, uh, uh, of what had happened that was crucial happened between the report for, 18, for the year 1865 and the report for the year 1866. By the late spring of 1866, an enormous amount had happened in the previous nine months, all of which would be lost in a static annual report. Additionally, um, so 
A, the data didn't say what I, what I assumed it would. Uh, B, I started to realize how many local studies when I encountered, you saw references to military posts that you go back to the Secretary of War records, and there was no mention of them at all. Um, so we had an assumption that there was very little military presence, um, but then we had a lot of these local studies that seemed to show it and data that didn't seem to reflect that. So I realized that I still thought I was going to be writing a study of the con context for the limits of occupation, but I realized that I would need to uh, figure out what those limits were at first. And so this led me into the National Archives. Uh, and the vast pools of documents that they have on the military. Um, but there were some challenges with this. A good amount of it was divided between the ways that the Army and then the archives divided between their wartime records and their post-war records, and this exactly um, transcended it, um, you know, or crossed over those boundaries. Uh, the National Archives finding aids, especially on the immediate post-war records, were extremely limited. Um, and uh, the ability to kind of walk in and say, oh, I'd like to know where the military was in North Carolina in 1866, uh, this was not a question that was going to immediately uh, sort of spark an answer, as many people have found in 19th century National Archives records. So, um, but I had the good luck of finding an archivist who at a quiet moment was willing to uh, kind of listen to me here very concretely and specifically, you know, what I was asking for and then to walk through the back stacks without me because they're closed now to researchers. Um, and he came back and he said, well, there's bad news. Um, and I thought, oh no. And he said, it's going to be in there, but it's going to be somewhere in this range of about 200 boxes uh, in each of two, you know, uh, sets. Um, so you're just going to have to kind of fumble through and figure out where it is in there. Um, and I was like, that's great news, because when I walked in, I was ready for the idea there wouldn't be nothing. Um, you know, or that it would be so scattered it'd be inaccessible or something. Uh, so I started working, you know, methodically through that. You'd get a box and sometimes it would be all on California. And, you know, for my purposes, it's an interesting question, but for my purposes, I just set it aside. Sometimes you'd get a box and there'd be the, you know, Department of South Carolina and it would be several days just literally getting the data down of these uh, reports that had been filed, had been opened and organized in the 1890s and a, and a reshuffling of the archival files. But many of them had been tied in the 1890s and not untied since. Uh, you know, still in their original uh, incredibly well-creased folding that the army clerks and the archival clerks uh, did and the archival clerks preserved, still with the old strings um, and then, you know, would spread them out and they'd have uh, this, these records that I would uh, then utilize adding into, at first, I didn't think there'd be enough to merit a spreadsheet. I had it just in a running Word file. Uh, then I started putting it into a spreadsheet. Um, and then I would come back uh, to, to where we lived and kind of work through the data I'd found. And one day my wife looked over and said, uh, you need to, uh, you know, break that into pieces. And I said, why? And she said, it's getting so large, it's going to overwhelm Excel. And I had been just working forward, you know, county by county. And I had, you know, uh, so many different series of data um, that it, it didn't break Excel. But that point is when I started to say, okay, I'm going to be able to add these things up, but that's not actually what I'm interested in. I'm interested in where, uh, because the other thing that was interesting was how many different sites the Army's located at during Reconstruction. Um, almost every county seat, some counties, uh, even relatively um, sparse counties with multiple posts among them, sometimes at places that are almost impossible to find. Um, luckily, I started talking uh, about this at Ayers, uh, who was leading a vast digital project at Virginia and then at Richmond. I uh, happened to, I can't remember if we had talked about it or he happened to hear about it. And so he asked me, uh, you know, about this and he said, uh, you know, I think you really need to think spatially and I think you really need some help. And he connected me, you know, which both of which were clearly true. And so I started working with Scott Nesbitt, who was then Ed's uh, grad student and now is a professor at the University of Georgia. Um, and Scott was, uh, had worked with Ed on the Visualizing Emancipation Project, which had some very interesting digital tools. And so Scott and I talked about the kind of data that I had, and he said, uh, we can definitely uh, you know, figure out how to help you with this. And the first thing he did was produce some static maps. And immediately, even a static map, a map that doesn't change, immediately 
um, when he sent me some static maps, you could just capture things that would be mentioned in the correspondence, but would be hard to see. Like, oh, the reason, you know, this line of posts are all along this one, you know, railroad spur, right? That there's a geographical logic to it that wouldn't be evident in a series of just lists of place names. Um, and you could also start to see things that, you know, even on a static map, um, that would be hard to capture immediately. Like, oh, look at this cluster that's starting to be formed uh, in this one group of eight or nine counties um, and visualized on a map that's immediately apparent. And this started to help, uh, you know, him helping me to ask the sort of broader questions that I had entered with the questions, but not with the real methodology of how to answer. Questions have been posed by Steve Ash and by a number of students of occupation during the war. What did it feel like to be governed and how was this shaped spatially? Um, Scott, because of his training, his own interests, had a much deeper background than this. And we started to look at the idea that a digital map, if done correctly, um, could start not to give the answers, but to sharpen those kind of questions. Uh, so with that, we, uh, you know, uh, applied for and got a couple of grants to uh, you know build this to turn the data into something that would be um, digital um, and that would allow for maps that were no longer static and that would also allow us to experiment with some of the tools that we got interested in um, so you know that's how I entered in there are tech people and then there are deep space people you know um, for me, it was the question of what it meant to experience reconstruction and to understand governance was a question that I was, could only answer. It has legal ramifications, political ramifications, economic, but at some level I felt it couldn't be answered without this basic question. How far do I have to go to find a power that I can access? And I, I think in the kind of the about uh, tab for the project, you mentioned kind of like these are not like precisions for lack of a better phrase that a lot of this is assumption and um, a lot of the project is just allowing users to kind of make their own determinations about in a way uh, their own determinations about the role of the army in the south like during reconstruction right that's right so what is it we hope to see at one level just plotting where the army is um, is interesting, but it doesn't inherently tell us all the things that we would like to know. Um, and in certain ways, it may not even tell us all that much, but it's what kind of questions you can apply to the, the data, right? The data doesn't tell us things. I use that phrase, but I try not to, right? It doesn't speak to us, right? We have to speak through it, uh, embedded in it. Um, but it doesn't inherently mean things absent our questions and frameworks for understanding it. So what I got interested in was, <clears throat> okay, you could get down pretty quickly to some specific data about where the military is, roughly for how long. This was never gonna be perfect, but you know, cause there'd be all kinds of, and we have, I think an 11 page list of places where errors can be introduced, including in things like uh, irreconcilable military records, right? Where what a bi-monthly report shows one thing and a monthly report shows something irreconcilable with it. Um, as well as, you know, all the other places the errors could be introduced. But that the questions we wanted to ask from that could not be absolutely reduced to a variable. I'll come back to this, uh, or to a, a mathematical equation. I'll come back to this because now it is being used for mathematical equations, uh, you know, and, and correlation claims that aren't inherently what I would do, but that's okay. You release something in the world and people do other things. What I was interested in something that was more, um, difficult to grasp, but crucially important, which is how did people experience the nature of being governed? And to me, the one answer to this is when did, when, how, how, on what terms, to what um, kind of degree of difficulty did they encounter government? And this is the kind of things that as Scott and I brainstormed. Once we had, you know, these, these outposts mapped, um, we brainstormed questions about how we could start to get at these issues. Indefinite, never precise, um, but issues that would help us to say, where in the South could you imagine at what points people were governed in one form, where were they governed in a different form, and where on a federal level might we start to say they were not governed at all? 
Uh, and that's what led us to the, the tools that you might have been asking about, um, which are conceptual tools rather than, era, rather than mathematical equations, a zone of access and a zone of occupation. Um, and these were ways of us thinking about how to bring together things that you find lots of examples of in the literature, um, but that are hard to um, quantify or even to sort of pull together in a, in a, in a clear way. So one thing you find a lot of is freed person comes in. Uh, you know, we tell a story of Peter Price who walks, uh, you know, a uh, miles, I forget how many now, a dozen or 15 or something miles into the Freedmen's Bureau office in Greensboro, North Carolina. Well, immediately, I think, and then that launches a series of events that appear in the archives, in this case, in the Freedmen's Bureau records, though sometimes in the, in the US Army papers. So, but immediately you start to think, okay, there's 4 million freed people in the South, even if you only count the Confederate States, you've got, you know, an extremely large number of people. Um, how many of them can do that? And when can they do that? And what does it mean if you go from in a period where you cannot access any federal government, like you can walk as far as you want, you're not gonna find them. So you can easily, so you can, but not so easily, so you can't. And this is where do we imagine that people could likely get to the government if they needed. Um, so we, you know, that was one of the, the conceptual tools we wanted to, to, to bring up. How would we show that? And there to do that, we made some assumptions that most freed people wouldn't have access to horses or mules or to railroads. And so that this would have been determined as in that Peter Price story by the distance a person could walk. Now, as soon as I say that, you're going to say, what person, where, you know, what conditions, right? The distance a person can walk in Appalachian, Tennessee in January is not the distance a person can walk in, um, you know, uh, in, in Middle Tennessee in May is not the person, distance a person can walk in the Delta in, uh, you know, the heart of, uh, of August or, you know, of August. Um, and each individual person, right? We all have different capacities, but we were trying to kind of come up with models that would help us to say, what does this look like? Where could people walk to get to? But then we had other things that come up in the uh, archives and that were again, hard to name. And those turn around this question. There were other places where the military wasn't there, but they would hear something's happening out in such and such and they could get there. And that to us defined a different realm, which was the zone of occupation. Um, not where a freed person could count on reaching the military or a direct bureau agent, but where a freed person could count on if they could somehow other way get word that the military could intervene if, it, if they wanted to. I mean, will is a different issue, but we were trying to sort of figure out what are the capacity questions before you get to the question of what of that capacity does the federal government or different military officers or feared means bureau agents want to use. So we mapped this as a zone of occupation. And again, we had to make some assumptions, probably easier ones because there's certain probably standardization around people in the military that would be harder to make up a broader um, society in terms of how far they could march. We usually had a good sense of whether there were cavalry there or not, which would change how fast they could go. And access to rail lines, which introduces a lot of uncertainty because different rail lines run in different ways. And so there are some where the military is clearly jumping on and off of rail lines and other places where they appear on a map, but it's much harder to know how often the military is using them. So all these things um, came in to create our, our model um, in which, uh, you know, and again, there's gonna be lots of differences based on how easy is it to cross a certain river, things that would take, you know, lifetimes to embed in a perfect granular way, but to set up some of these conceptual models. And this was our zones of occupation. Um, what did it mean to live in an area where the military could reach you if you could get word and if they chose to? Um, and then together, these two things point to a third region, um, which is uh, the areas where the federal government is basically not governing at all, regardless of will or intention, uh, where you can't reach the military and the military really can't reach you without a multiple days. 
where they're only going to go in if a huge conflagration happens to such a degree that it's getting, uh, you know, essentially into the press or something like that. So these three types of experiences of occupation, which have some you know, analogies in the ways people talk about 20th and 21st century experiences of being occupied, as each different formative ways of shaping how would freed people experience this period. A government they could reach, a government that could reach them, a government completely out of reach. And how do those things change over time? And how does that start to upset some of our understandings of what Reconstruction was and how it worked? So those are the models that we set up. As soon as you apply them to individual terrain, they start to go a little, uh, you know, they, they start to run into the problems of any model in that context. Um, and we've always tried to build in that these are models. Um, but in fact, as I mentioned at the start of this answer, there are social scientists um, who use the data set to look for very clear correlations. If you can say there's this level of military force for this long, does that mean there's this likelihood of voting or this likelihood of land acquisition? Um, and those are really interesting questions. Um, as a historian, I'm not certain that the correlations are going to answer those questions. Um, but that's why I'm a historian and not a sociologist, right? You know, the flaws in the data really bother me in making those kinds of generalizations. But as they point out, there is no data, even on the 20th first century, that's not deeply flawed. And there's certainly no data on the 19th century that's flawed in this, that's not flawed in these kind of respects. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, you pointed it out numerous times, but that, I think that is the most interesting thing about this project is being able to visualize those changes over time and see those different experiences of uh, reconstruction. And so, I mean, I was tinkering around with it. Uh, I'm uh, originally from South Alabama and just looking at, uh -huh. uh, you know, the presence of Union soldiers in Baldwin County, where I'm from, and then looking across right. the day at Mobile is dramatically different, which as you mentioned, would Huge. mean dramatically different experiences for people of color during that period. That's right. And again, we'd never assumed, and in, in my writing, I always try and point out that the question of what the army will do, what they can, you know, uh, in a place where they can, is an open question. And there's lots, lots of examples of the military intervening for freed people, of the military oppressing freed people, the military ignoring. But the question of capacity allows us to start to assess things like that. Um, what does it mean to live in a place that sh may share, I certainly don't know Baldwin County like you do, but that may share a great deal top of, you know, in terms of topography, in terms of agriculture, um, with a you know, place that's quite proximate, especially in contemporary terms, and yet have a completely different experience of being governed in a way that's hard to, to pin down. Um, and in a way, writing local studies, which is how we try and often grasp these questions, is central and crucial for what we do as historians, but a difficult way to answer that question because uh, in essence, this is just one of the background facts of life. And it's not until you start to see on a more comparative level, in this sense, just even comparative across South Alabama, that it starts to emerge, oh, this is actually something that might be functioning different in this county that might be functioning quite differently from this county 20 miles away for reasons that might speak to how the roads work, where the railroads were, you know, what advice someone gave the commander in Mobile, uh, who knows why. Um, and uh, so those kind of, you know, we couldn't either on the website or in my writing capture um, the level of those micro distances, but uh, micro differences. But what I hope it does is permit people to ask some of those questions um, with this broader sense of perspective. That again, the answer to Baldwin County is likely going to be in Baldwin County, but the questions you ask about Baldwin County might well be shaped quite differently if you're able to think about what's happening here um, that's a product of it being on one type of trajectory of being governed um, that's not a universal one and it's not one you can necessarily read exactly back into uh, the motivations or intentions of the actors in DC, but instead reflects this, un this sometimes unusual or surprising uh, divergence in experiences. Um, and I think the relationship of that, you mentioned Mobile to city life, is something that we've touched upon in, in scholarship. And certainly there's been some extraordinary work on cities. 
Um, but it's been hard to capture, and certainly that's widely understood the movement of freed people to cities during the war and, and reconstruction. Um, and some of that's sort of seemingly self-evident, right? And there's been some fine studies about what becomes possible in city life, uh, even with all of its limitations, Tira Hunter, other great work. Um, but in some other respects, Caitlin Verboon now, other people. But in some ways, I think that our understanding of the draw of the city um, also gets uh, limited by the fact that the city are the places where we know about the most extreme acts of violence because they get the most coverage, right? Uh, so, you know, you think about Memphis and the massacres in Memphis in 1866, uh, the series of massacres well written about it in New Orleans over the course of Reconstruction. Um, and clearly that's a defining part of city life. Um, but it raises the question, if this is what's happening, why are free people moving there? Um, one answer, you know, I think that you see repeated over and over in free people's uh, later memoirs, as well as in some other forms of narratives, is they're moving to places like Memphis exactly because the army's there, not because they believe the army is virtuous, but because they know what they're facing if they don't. Um, and, you know, I think that's a crucial context, that people can have grave skepticism and cynicism about the motives of the U.S. Army, um, and yet still see it as a counterweight to a planter force that they know what that's, uh, with a certainty, what they're trying to accomplish. And that casts a light on something that, you know, we know intellectually, but is, again, hard to capture, which is that the insurgency of the uh, white Southerners was a rural insurgency. Uh, and that Memphis and New Orleans were incredible, are amazing moments to study, horrific moments, moments should be you know, commemorated, moments that had a big impact on politics because they moved to the national press. But the continual, relatively smaller scale by, you know, uh, on individual actions, um, violence in the countryside, in the plantation belts especially, is what permitted the insurgency to start to claim control over the region. And somehow we have to, we can do a better job of conceptualizing what all of that rural violence adds up to and how it helps us to explain that relationship between countryside or plantation belt and city or crossroads town in this period. Um, you've already kind of talked briefly about kind of like the data and the source base that you use to kind of construct this digital project, but I was just curious, I mean, you know, there's tons of maps that give you different looks at the South during this period. I was just curious, what other kind of sources did you draw upon to kind of, you know, form these zones of access and occupation? I guess outside of the um, the monthly reports that you mentioned, I mean, there's a, I was kind of blown away. There's a length to those reports, and I think it's like 51 pages of just military right. reports that go into uh, to building this. But you also mentioned there's census data and obviously election data also. Right, railroad lines, right? So we did some overlays. So collecting the data, so the problem with the military reports is that you can think you understand something and then you don't. So you see a report in the Department of North Carolina says X number of soldiers in Charlotte. And you're like, great. But then you get a report for the Western District of Sub-District of North Carolina and it shows a far smaller number of people in Charlotte, and it shows people in all these towns that aren't listed in the you know, statewide report. Well, what's that mean? That essentially the commander in Charlotte is reporting to the commander in Raleigh, this is the number of people that are in control of, and I find you know, that each time you think you know where the soldiers are, you, it turns out that they're more widespread than you thought. Um, so that was a, that's the reason why there needed to be so much cross-checking and double-checking. Um, because often what you're finding is where the commanding officer is posted, not where the soldiers under that person's command are. And that speaks to, and that's crucial if you want to understand it, the geographical and spatial reach of an occupation. But as we laid those things against the, uh, against other data, um, you know, there's a lot of things that I would like to be able to do as our first, you know, gambit. We thought people would be interested in being able to look, as you said, at census data to be able to get a sense of is the military more, you know, appear to be more likely to be going to areas with relatively large African American populations, which would speak to its role in shaping the end of, uh, you know, the completion of emancipation. 
Is it more likely to be going into areas with relatively larger white populations, which especially in the upper south would mean they're more likely to be moving in to areas where there are white unionists and continuing warfare against uh, white former Confederates uh, and questions like that. It's more likely to be plantation belts or sort of Piedmont regions with relatively large but not majority African American populations. Is there a sense that the military is going to areas of, of uh, very large African American populations in order to prevent, you know, freed people from, uh, you know, being able to exert the kind of control they might otherwise because of numerical, uh, because of numbers is that, you know, so all of these things would be possible and things that, um, you know, it made sense to look at. Um, the, we also overlaid with electoral returns so that people could look to see military occupation and uh, some of the vote totals of the different elections uh, between 1868 and 1876, I think. Um, because again, this was a sort of level of efficacy people were interested in, as well as uh, railroad lines so that people could understand the relationship of this to transportation. Um, but with world enough and time, there's a million things that you could imagine connecting this to, including things like uh, that some of these other social scientists have been studying, um, some of which only become apparent later in the, in the century. Things like property, levels of property ownership by African Americans, things like, um, you know, levels of educational attainment, and, and there's all kinds of other things that would be really interesting to overlay with that. And the thing that we never really figured out how to do in a way that felt um, satisfying and so doesn't, didn't include it in the final product um, would be in relation to violence. Um, is it that freed people are, that, that the military are moving into spots where there have recently been um, large acts of uh, violence by uh, white planters and others against freed people? Uh, does that level of violence decrease? Does it increase? What happens as they move away? And what we found there was a real basic challenge, which is uh, at one level, when you look at it, the number one way to predict, I think, I don't, can't say this mathematically, of where you're going to find lots of violence reports is where there's lots of military. So that could lead you to say the military is, uh, you know, doing the opposite, right? Where the military is, violence erupts, and everywhere else it's peaceful. But in fact, um, what in fact it, 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 it struck us that it represented um, was that where do we get actual reports of violence from the military and where they're not, uh, we're not getting those reports except in scattered ways. Um, and with a few exceptions around say Ku Klux Klan investigations, that remains true. So it's very hard to disentangle that problem that the military is not only a, an agent of force, but it's also eyes of the federal government in a federal government that has almost no other eyes anyway. So of course things are gonna be reported more in areas with army regions, um, but it's uh, in a way that just casts into light this sort of great mystery. Uh, so, uh, Congressman at the 1888, maybe 1890 in that period, estimates, and it's you know an estimate that there are 50,000 African Americans killed for political reasons in the 25 years since the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, you know, it could be more, um, but it's very hard to pin down uh, those numbers in part because, um, you know, so many of them occur in these rural areas out of sight that, that are in fact ungoverned by the federal government. And so that's a sort of dream set, I mean, horrifying dream set, but a dream set of data, um, of, you know, that one would love to be able to overlap with this and other data of understanding where, when, to what magnitude, and in what patterns um, does the white insurgent Southern violence um, really express most directly, brutally, murderously upon free people. So um, I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about the kind of, uh, again, the intellectual foundations of the project. In the methods uh, portion on the website, there's a number of uh, scholars and their works that you mentioned kind of as kind of like the basis for this project? Mm -hmm. There's a couple of different foundations. There are people who arrived at a spatial explanations uh, or invoke spatial explanations, I think largely through their efforts to wrestle with the data itself. So I mentioned Steve Ash before. There's a number of people who write about unionism, occupation during the war, white Southern unionism, about the experience of occupation, write about free people's experience, whereas they did that, whether in a localized study or sometimes in larger ones, 
they became attuned to the idea that the differences didn't just uh, emerge from different socioeconomic categories. How did cotton plantation belts look different than Piedmont belts, than uh, tobacco belts, than sugar districts and mountains, um, but that there were also these really interesting, as Steve Ash said, these different zones of experience. Um, and some of this sort of moving in from a literature on comparative occupations. Um, so that was one of the, the roots of, of what we had, that there were people who understood that this was happening and were kind of struggling to find a language that would work to capture it. The other is that there's been a very large, uh, as you invoked, uh, spatial turn in both uh, digital humanities and in other aspects and, you know, emerging, you know, maybe in part out of uh, the expansion of geography as a field and moving from there, you know, across other fields into spatial experience in different ways. Um, and so there had been, by the time we were doing this, quite a large literature um, that emphasized space, some of which was re directly rooted in, in this field. So Tony Kay and Stephanie Camp, both uh, uh, deeply missed and departed uh, 19th century scholars who really took space very, 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 um, made it very central to their work in understanding emancipation. Um, and in understanding the experience of slavery and the experience of being free as something with deeply rooted spatial, uh, you know, spatial, uh, the fact that space shaped in, in very important ways, as well as really wide ranging, um, you know, work on spatial analysis and other fields. There, Scott was far ahead of me. And so to the degree that we do it well, it's surely a, a, a tribute to Scott Nesbitt, and he is deep grounding it. Um, and to the degree that we fumble it, surely it's him trying to drag me along that, uh, that, that slowed that down. And some of those things have taken pretty different turns in the several years since it uh, you know, came online. So I'm not sure um, you know, and about those things. I'm not an expert on where spatial analysis sits today in 2020. I'm always very interested in kind of like the stylistic choices for these uh, digital humanities projects. And I know you said you were kind of more on the like, uh, you know, historical side of this, trying to address questions to these digital projects. But just, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about kind of like the decisions by to go with like the spatial narrative and then also to present this material um, with the addition of a interactive map. Yeah, one of the things, so, you know, I knew that in the book, now there's been some interesting work that has tried to build interactive books. And Scott was, you know, working toward that um, at the time. And Nicole Myers Turner has a, has a book that has multiple editions, some of which are allowed for some overlaying and interactivity. Um, but, you know, as I was working on my book, I had a sense that the book itself would, would be, would include maps, but static maps. And that instead what we would be looking at um, would be, you know, if we were aiming to capture this dynamism, it would have to be digitally. Um, and the second thing to answer your second question is once that became clear, Scott said, you know, either we can sort of guide people by the hand or we can let people mess around. Um, and, um, and we both pretty quickly realized that, well, people, we wanted to give people enough guidance for them to understand what was there. Um, that we wanted people to be able to mess around. That the point of the data that you know we had and that I had collected um, was that it was going to overwhelm. You know, if I had written a book that was you know utilized all of that data, it had been thousands of pages and, and completely unreadable. Um, in the old days, scholars included giant appendices or published second volumes if it did really, you know, if it was a book that got a lot of attention. Fogel and Ingerman or whatever, some of these appendices that people still use even if they're no longer driven by the overall argument. It's been a source of great frustration to me that we've lost that sense in scholarship and that there's a number of books that purport to have really deep, um, in some cases global, archival bases and they show you a few glimpses of it in a form that really reads like an anecdote and the rest of it just disappears. This seems to me like an extraordinarily selfish vision of scholarship that, that I do worry about taking hold in the field that ties the, uh, you know, thinks of a scholarly product as a form for marketing or branding. And so that anything that you give away, you know, you're literally giving away so that control is what matters. <laughs> 
So I find it very uncomfortable with the idea that people take outside funding for grants, turn it into a product that they benefit for, and withhold, um, you know, uh, the kind of findings that people might have that, um, you know, would lead to all kinds of other directions that they're aiming for a kind of control that really makes me uncomfortable. Um, I understand why they do it. The reason they do it is when you release the data, people find flaws in it and they sometimes find flaws in your argument. Um, you know, um, to me, that's scholarship. Uh, people have written in with things that are errata, and when they're right, you know, we fix it and we add it to our running list of changes. Um, sometimes uh, there are things that I, you know, that, that I think almost anybody would have gotten wrong that go to things I tried to catch, but it's hard, which is name changes of towns and states that have multiple towns that had multiple towns in the 19th century with the same name. Uh, and sometimes I look at that and I'm like, this is a compelling case that I got it wrong, but it would have been 20 years to figure out, yeah, I mean, that, that, that absent this kind of local knowledge. Uh, sometimes they're just genuine, you know, coding mistakes. So far, no one has used the data to try and overturn, you know, my larger claims. But if they want to do it, you know, go for it. To me, that's, that's the model of scholarship we need. And one of the exciting things about what digital humanities can offer is someone who, as I said, comes in not as an expert, but the two, you know, in digital humanities. The two pieces of it that I find exciting are one, the idea that it can lead to not just different question, answers, but questions. That it can reshape how we think, um, not just how, and that it can go so far beyond the ways that it's often used just to illustrate. Uh, and so that's something that I've been very moved by, the idea that our questions get broader. But the second is that it can allow for a dissemination of knowledge that used to happen through some of those appendices or that for some of our social science colleagues happens through data sets. It strikes me as odd that, uh, our, in, at least in our system, um, you know, people in social sciences get credit on their review, research reviews for publishing data sets that other people use. And that's not really a part of history. It should be a part of history. It's an incredible service to the profession. In fact, in most books, you know, you could well say the data set might be a more service to the profession than the book itself. And that might be true of, of mine too. If so, that's fine. If our goal is to build a scholarly argument that we should support it, and digital humanities has made it much easier for people to do that and to make it accessible rather than behind, you know, sort of paywalls or something known only to insiders. Um, so those were the decisions that we made. We wanted people to ask questions that we either couldn't ask or couldn't you know, present in a way. Um, and that meant them being able to manipulate the maps. And then we wanted them to be able to work with the data and that meant that the data itself uh, should be accessible in raw form, even if that exposed errors that we could otherwise have covered. Um, I wanna just uh, get, uh, ask you a, a brief question here. But, you know, for people interested in getting involved in digital projects like that, they want to start their own digital project, you know, what, what, what would be your tips for them how to, how to get going on, a, on something like this? So that's a good question because it's something that comes up in my, um, you know, graduate advising or, you know, dealing with other people uh, who sort of ask this question. And it's something that I pose to Scott. So I'll defer to his answer, which might, you know, change over time. Uh, you know, the, as a grad student in history or someone starting off in history, or, you know, to what degree is the approach to learn technical expertise? And the advice that I relay from him to people, though obviously it's advice that could change, is to be wary of that because it's possible to spend a great deal of time acquiring technical expertise, then to develop the, you know, archival basis. And by the time you get ready to apply your technical expertise, the technology has changed so much that the time spent in it um, is, uh, you know, is, is, is less useful than it could have been. Um, and that instead to be looking for ways of connecting either through campus, through grants or other things um, with people who have the technical expertise at the center of their job and, you know, to develop instead a sense of the bigger issues at play, you know, which Scott has a, you know, broad command of, um, but he didn't do the coding, you know, of our project. He worked with the people who did the coding of our project. They, I would be on those meetings, but I was of no help because I couldn't process what they were saying in clear enough terms to be useful. Scott could. That level of knowledge is really important either to have or to find a collaborator who has. 
Um, but to be the person who's implementing with all the sort of what, you know, when are people shifting from, you know, this particular program to this other one that just suddenly surpassed it, um, that that can be a profession in and of itself and can be hard to square with the amount of demands that, that we make in history or in related fields. Um, so that's one way that I would, would answer that, that you need to understand the questions behind it, and that really comes from history and related humanities and humanistic social sciences. The questions that come in our case out of space and other questions may come out of somewhere else. Um, and then, you know, it's useful for people to develop enough knowledge that they can see sort of what are the possibilities? How do some of the things that are out there work and how have they been interpreted and reused in terms of different forms of digital humanities? And how can they start to convert that to their own uh, you know, work? Um, on the other hand, there are people, including Ed Davis, who have made that turn um, and who've been able to sort of uh, you know, find um, targeted ways where they can gain you know, relatively accessible technical knowledge and turn it into products more quickly. Um, and so, it, you know, in certain cases, depending on what you're trying to do uh, or the kind of training you have access to, there may be, you know, some of those cases where in fact it makes a lot of sense um, that, you know, somebody would say, don't learn everything, but actually here for what you want to do and what you have, here's one thing that you can learn master pretty quickly and turn it around in a way that'll sh demonstrate a kind of proof of concept pretty quickly. And so I've seen people do that as well. Um, but, you know, so some of this is, uh, you know, what are you trying to do? Um, how can you develop this sense of the possibilities out there, the questions and the other variety of approaches and start to turn that toward, um, you know, what it is that you want to do with that? Where does your abstract questions to meet the sort of practical levels of digital humanities and come together and their overlap with your field of study. Um, I want to ask you uh, just one final question here. Um, you know, I think right, you know, right now in this current moment with the pandemic going on, you know, educators at all levels are facing a lot of new challenges and are having to adapt you know, in order to, to continue, you know, presenting material in class and even researching uh, for their own for their own projects. So I was just wondering what your, you know, opinions are, um, what your thoughts are on kind of, you know, the value and utility of digital humanities projects, especially right now. Well, it's never been a time when, uh, you, know, there's the, you know, they're always useful. You know, the world is more and more uh, virtual. This was true before the, you know, COVID. Um, and, uh, but clearly, I think as, uh, you know, people are wrestling with uh, the difficulty in accessing some of the sources, the difficulty in accessing some of the um, texts that they would use, uh, some of which are relatively easy to get through subscriptions or other forms with some of which are not. Um, the digital sites are especially meaningful. Uh, they're meaningful for scholars who might be struggling even themselves to get access. They're meaningful, they've always been meaningful for teachers who sometimes, you know, hear relatively frequently from junior high school or high school teachers who sort of come across the site and not even sure exactly how in a way that they'd be less likely to come across a, uh, you know, something written in a scholarly journal or something. Um, for some of them. But I think we take that and then we magnify the, uh, you know, COVID crisis. Um, you know, it's, magnif it's all magnified by this crisis. And so people are really struggling to figure out, you know, what kind of projects can I do? What could a seminar project or a year-long research project or even a dissertation project look like if in much of the country I can't get into archives? And this is where data sets provide, you know, this real um, uh, possibilities um, to, you know, immediate access to certain kinds of data um, that are really rich and meaningful. And that hasn't been, and that you also see in some other forms of just uh, digital archives, which are amazing and wonderful. Um, and uh, so I think that we're going to see, you know, a window of people who are grad students who are really having to depend upon those, even if in their self-conception, they picture themselves sitting inside an archive. They can't sit inside an archive in most of the country right now. 
Um, so I think they're especially meaningful now. Um, but I don't think that meaning will go away once this is over. I think, uh, you know, even on that, you know, blessed day when we get to go back in archives, uh, people who've gotten accustomed to using um, digital archives, digital, uh, you know, uh, humanity sites are going to keep going back to them. All right, what we're looking at here is the entry page into mapping occupation. Um, so this has a, a range of things that you can do through the storyboard function. Uh, as, as we talked about that, uh, you know, both Scott Nesbitt and I were interested in the idea that people would be able to manipulate the numbers and manipulate the maps and use them in the ways that they wanted. But we're also aware that they, many people would find it difficult to begin doing that um, because they couldn't figure out what they were looking at. Uh, and then after we go through this, we'll look at the exploratory map. You can see both the excitement that it brings, but also the difficulty uh, at first of making sure you know what you're looking at. Uh, so this is a static map that's just an introductory page. There's different levels of size of, uh, of dots, indicates the number of troops um, in a place, and they're scattered across, uh, across the map. The ones that are floating are in, in and near the Florida Keys is why there are some that appear to be floating in the, uh, in the ocean. And then on the other side of the page is a narrative because we also knew that even that many people, uh, you know, especially teachers and members of the public, but also even some scholars looking to find something for a survey or something um, would find uh, that they need some background. Why, what does this say? Um, why is it important? So the storyboard narrates them through uh, some ways of seeing um, in, a, in, in different forms uh, what they're looking at. So this is a narration of the, where the U.S. Army is as the Confederacy surrenders. Um, so you can see a large-scale concentration in the Upper South, large-scale concentration in Middle Tennessee, um, some scattered sites across the Chesapeake region. Uh, and then, you know, small posts left behind as the U.S. Army marches through. Um, but at this point, they're still focused at this point on defeating the Confederate armies um, uh, in the field, um, rather than in, in governing as, uh, you know, a sort of secondary project, something that's there. Um, and we can see this really interesting uh, produced uh, uh, by the chief of uh, military history, this interesting way, um, old way of trying to map these different things of where did the U.S. control at different times. Uh, you know, again, a static map, um, but that uses some of these cross-hatching. Obviously, they're working, you know, it was working in the context of black and white. Um, but, you know, to show what does the U.S. control in different years of the war as a way of trying to approach these questions and raise them. Um, so then the narrative moves forward, and now we start to see what you'll be able to see in a minute on the uh, underlying map because what it pulls from here is, is not a static map, but the underlying map. Um, what we have here is a, um, where the army is in June 1865. So if we showed an army um, that was relatively consolidated even in April, May, you can see that it's starting to spread even in June 1865. Um, the different colors, we, we worked on some different, you know, ways of marking a lot of different information, which is hard. The different colors are total. Um, black troops are in blue. Uh, cavalry are in uh, orange. And places that have both black troops and cavalry are in, uh, you know, in, in purple. As well as, again, also different efforts of conveying size. Um, so, um, this, as you'll see on the underlying map, allows you to look and to see that in Montgomery, Alabama, June 1865, there are 2,400 cavalry troops, a total of 16,000 troops. Uh, at that moment, no African-American troops reported there. Uh, so some relatively large concentrations as the army starts to move. Um, but then a key point of the, of the book represents the question that's posed over the summer of 1865 about what they call practical emancipation, which is what happens as the military starts to wrestle with the reports coming in from freed people after Confederate surrender, that the Confederacy might have surrendered, but planters have not given up their power. 
and instead to ask what happens as the army really recognizes that they can't pass through, but have to keep re-embedding themselves in the exact plantation districts um, that have been very hard to manage in other occupations. Most occupation theory at the time said you occupied cities and transportation hubs. Many people assumed, including William Sherman, that it was impossible to occupy rural areas effectively because of the problem of controlling space. But if you're going to reach the freed people, if you're going to enforce even basic emancipation, even literally basic emancipation, people not being sold, much less enforce some claims on whipping, on family formation, on wages, you have to go out into the countryside. And so here by September 1865, you can see a mapping of Georgia and South Carolina real deep clusters forming in the area inland of Hilton Head, which had been, you know, a, a, site of, uh, a site of occupation early in the war, just the start of moves into more of the upcountry. An enormous and fascinating concentration in uh, western Georgia, including an area of enormous violence as portrayed by a number of scholars. Um, and so uh, some of these things, this pulls up the population of the county um, that, are, that live there, um, but a relatively large scale county, uh, black populations in these counties, 77 soldiers in Georgetown, soldiers in places like LaGrange, West Point, um, where you could go through and start to see things about the county uh, as well as the number of soldiers there. So this sense that what's happening over the course of 1865 is first this basic question. First, you know, can subdue these Confederate armies. Second, enforce a sense of loyalty. Um, but third, can you enforce a sense even of basic emancipation? And you can see here what it means to look at this without the shading, which is of the, shows the proportion of black population, so what it is on the map, and width, which shows um, different levels of uh, census data on the percentage of population that's African American. And the start of this sort of awareness of, of the concentration of military forces in the areas with relatively large African American populations, um, including in some of these regions. Um, this led us to then our efforts to map what we talked about before. What it means to look back at this map and to say, so what is the zone of access? If we take those places, what are the areas where people live in where they should be able to reach a military post in, in uh, you know, where they should be able to reach a military post. And you can see that this is just a sort of walking map, our efforts to estimate how far people could walk. Already early on, these white areas mean that they're areas that we don't assume that free people could reach any person, even a solo person of the military. The areas of occupation shows the areas that the military could reach out to. So what are the ones that involve um, the access to cavalry? expanding that, access to railroad lines. And so in this area, what's it mean to think of areas that are governed and ungoverned, even at this moment, a relatively large military population? Within a year, um, we see a pretty steady drop. So from September 1865, here's the zone of occupation of the South, not the entirety of the South, not large areas, say, for example, the mountains and other areas, but a large amount of the South where at least the military could reach if they needed to. By September 1866, that's declined pretty dramatically. Uh, and as the U.S. enters so-called military reconstruction in uh, the debates of the fall of 1866 and then the implementation beginning in February, March 1867, they're doing so actually from a much reduced military presence. So they've got more military authority, but much less military spread. But another thing we hope to capture was that these are not static questions. And so in November 1867, again, a resurgence of military presence uh, in order to carry out the military reconstruction. Nothing like what it was in 1865 in terms of places like uh, Western Georgia, Southwestern Georgia, but a relatively widespread tie to enforcing um, elections. This on the side is an image. Um, and then an effort to plot that, where is the army in October, the end of October, 1868? And how does that plot with countywide returns on election results? So the election results, red, the more red, the more Republican, the more blue, the more Democratic. 
Um, and we see here, and, you know, the lack of election returns for states that remain under reconstruction. Um, and uh, with this underlying data here, you can just start to make some inferences. With underlying data, you can really start to start to study it. 1869, so now we've got the army as uh, yeah, military reconstruction has been ended, except in four states. Um, what's the army spread look like there? Very widespread in Texas, the one clear band that's about establishing a frontier zone and a defense against the Comanche and Apache and others. Um, and others are remaining presence in eastern Texas, much more closely tied to river and plantations. Um, but the great drop in areas that have been moved to, um, uh, moved to self governance. And what does peacetime occupation look like? So one way to look at this is to look at what happens in the Ku Klux Klan responses. This is South Carolina in February 1871. Uh, so prior to um, Ulysses S. Grant's um, declaration of a state of insurrection in a series of counties in the South Carolina upcountry. And this is what the response to the Klan looks like on the ground of where the military moves in between February and June. And you can start to see this on, on the underlying map. And then a question that's just an effort to show, to sort of stop a basic piece of misinformation. People will often say the military withdrew from the South in the so-called Compromise of 1877, um, which is something that's not only not true, but it's self-evidently not true. Um, if forced to, uh, to answer a question, if instead the question was, do you think there was a long period of time when the US Army was not stationed in the South? Most people would understand if the question was posed that way, that it's clear the answer is no, the military continues to have bases in the South. They're reduced. There is important movement, especially the seventh, you know, famous movement of the Seventh Cavalry and others. But the military remains in smaller numbers and in more widespread, um, but in the South throughout the period that we study and throughout U.S. history. There's never a withdrawal. That's a myth of U.S. history, though there is a massive reduction over time that plays an important role. Um, and this is an image from the time that shows what does happen in 1877, which is the march of people, as Heather Cox Richardson and others have shown a few blocks. In this case, from in New Orleans, what happens is the movement of soldiers from the meeting place of the Louisiana legislature back to their back to their barracks. Uh, eventually, a number of those are sent overseas, but not sent to the West and, or back home, but not a majority. Um, so you, there, then this gives you an explanation of what you can do with the underlying map. So what's it mean if you want to look at total troops, or if you're really, you know, emphasizing looking at the number of total? What's it mean if you want to look at cavalry? So 1868, you can see that even as there remain a decent number of infantry in the South, cavalry has been sent home. Much of this or, or taken off of, uh, off of, or off of, no longer mounted. Where are black troops located? This happens to be for 1868, but you can run this over different times if you want to see that. What's the zone of occupation? What's the zone of access? Where can people walk to the military? Where are the railroads? We use the data set on 1870 railroad system from Will Thomas uh, to build this, though some of these are in the process of being reconstructed. What's voting data you know, look like? Um, for the 1868 election, or 1872, or 1880, um, and then census data. Um, what's it mean if we plot this area against the relative density of Af proportion of African American population? Um, and so all these things then help to guide you after the narrative into your uh, the way that you can control your own map. This is the underlying map. It's called the exploratory map on the side. Um, and the underlying map allows you to uh, kind of run the, you know, to make your own decisions and to run them over time. So total troops, you could run it just for cavalry or for black troops. We can plot against railroads. Uh, I think it's interesting to plot against zones of occupation. What part of the South uh, could the military actually reach? Um, and uh, to run this over time. So to watch it expand immediately after surrender, to see the number of troops draw down, to see the pieces in the winter of 1865 to 66, uh, where much of the South is no longer governed, to see some efforts to rebuild that and some different regional differences in the Carolinas, especially in parts of the Mississippi River. Uh, the start of military reconstruction, the degree to which that leads to an expansion of uh, where the military is and uh, 
You can see that play through then as we get to 1868, expansion around the election and the use of the military during the election, um, as well as a drawdown except for the four states that remain under military rule over 1869. Even there, it's lower than you might expect. You can see the sort of uh, vast numbers, vast number of outposts in Texas. Um, and this sort of idea of what we call a railroad sense of federal power, where the primary places the government can reach are cities that are on railroad lines and places that are adjacent to railroad lines. We'll start to see in early 1871, the start of a revival of the presence of the military to combat uh, vigilante and Klan violence in upcountry South Carolina, different set of, uh, you know, uh, of violence in the areas around central and northern Kentucky. Um, that start to ebb over 1872. It's just running sort of month by month, making a draw from the data. Um, and uh, some, you know, resurgence of efforts to put down violence, some in 1873, some more will come in 74 to 75. And then as it runs through, we'll get to see what it looks like around the election of 1876. So it takes a few minutes. We're sort of running through 1874. There's some periods now where you can see how much of the South appears ungoverned, some resurgence in the fall of 1874, some of that tied to the midterm elections. Uh, and then an effort of a reimposition in part in 1875 that leads to a drawdown that helps us contextualize things like the Grant's uh, refusal to support the Mississippi state government. 1876 and the coming of the election and we really start to see the spread again in the fall of people closer to election sites. What happens in 1877, we're now in the Hayes administration, so May, June, a shrinking of the military's profile, but not the disappearance of it. Um, and then how sort of small scale military presence continues throughout when this stops in December 1880, uh, with occasional appearances of, uh, of spots that are tied to enforcements by US marshals or commissioners over the course of 1879 and 1880. So uh, this allows people to sort of look to see what kind of questions they can ask about the map that they wouldn't otherwise. The final thing I'll point to, I'll, I'll do it from here, is the data. So if you go to the data page, uh, you can download the entire data set, the list of sources, um, how we got our census data and boundaries, the presidential voting data source, um, the locations of the railroad system. Um, and then there are also so here, you know, the credits of the design, um, and then here, a discussion of where we got the um, reports of the troop locations, um, the kind of sources of error that you can find, um, the description of the zones of occupation and zones of access, um, as well as uh, some other information that you, can, uh, that you can use to try and make, uh, make sense of the data that you can access and utilize. So Dr. Downs, thank you so much for taking some time to talk with the war today. And uh, thank you really for a fascinating conversation about um, mapping occupation. Uh, for people interested in exploring this, uh, you can find the digital project at mappingoccupation.org. You can also go to the H of War resource tab and there'll be a link to it uh, under digital humanities. And you can also find this video there. Uh, so before I let you go, Dr. Downs, uh, where can people find you on the web? So, so I am uh, accessible through the UC Davis website at my you know, faculty page there. Um, other than that, I don't have the same level of uh, social media you know, presence as uh, Scott or some of my colleagues, part because I try and you know, uh, save my time for my work. Uh, you know, but uh, you know, I'm accessible there, including uh, other, uh, other publications and things like that.